and greet someone around you. Welcome them to the service. Yeah. 
grace and wisdom know his name. It is well. prayer. Father God, we pause this morning as we come into this place to worship you, and we can say that it is well with our soul because of your love, because of your sacrifice, because of the truth of your word, which reminds us that you are coming again. So Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here. We thank you for each one who has come. Our prayer and our desire as we go through this service is to honor and to glorify you, to equip the saint and to warn the sinner. So Father, we pray your blessing upon this servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Extend Christian greetings to each one present this morning. I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 6. And I want to begin reading at verse 11. First Timothy 6, verse 11 and verse 12. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He begins in this portion of scripture, and it's Paul writing to Timothy, but he says, but you, O man of God. What a title. What a title. Man of God. Deuteronomy speaks about Moses. Moses was a man of God. In the book of Samuel, it refers to Samuel when he's going up to offer a sacrifice to Bethlehem. And they trembled because the man of God was coming to Bethlehem. Elijah was known as a man of God. Many of the prophets were referred to as 
men of God or messengers of God. And I think that title is significance, significant when Paul says to Timothy, but you, O man of God, what makes us a man of God? What is it that caused Paul to say to Timothy, but you, O man of God? There is only one reason that we can be referred to as a man of God or a woman of God, and that is because of our relationship, our acceptance of God's provision of salvation in Jesus Christ. And when we accept Christ as our Savior and Lord, we become a child of God. We've often heard the phrase, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. And it's amazing sometimes when you look at characteristics of children, how you see that characteristic in a child that was also in the parent. And we say, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. Well, as believers... As God's children, the apple shouldn't fall far from the tree. If we are a child of God, then yes, it would be fitting and normal to say, Abe, man of God. Kimberly, woman of God. It's a title of honor that Paul is bestowing upon Timothy. And I think it's, it's more yet than that. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to Timothy to remind him of who he is. And because he is a man of God, it's going to affect how he lives. It's going to affect how we live if we constantly are reminded and remember that I am a man of God or I am a woman of God. If we keep that in the forefront of our minds. Paul goes on in verse 11 and he says, flee these things And the things that he's talking about are in the prior verses, the desire to be rich, the desire to be clothed with fine clothing, the the love of money. But he says, flee these things and pursue. Pursue what? And he gives us a list of things there. He says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. What does it mean to pursue righteousness? What is righteousness? Righteousness, the the, the word there in the Greek for the word righteousness is simply conveys the meaning of that I pay my proper duty to man and to God. That's righteousness. How I live my life I live it properly to my fellow men and women, the people around me, but I also live, have my proper duty to God. So there's a balance there in, in, the, in the righteousness that Paul is speaking about here to Timothy. And then he goes on and he, he lists three virtues that come next. And the, the first one of those is godliness. Godliness. Now, how, what's the difference between righteousness and godliness? Well, the word there for godliness doesn't mean that we are like God, because we can't be. We are made in God's image, 
but we cannot be God because we are not all-knowing, we are not om- omnipresent, we're not everywhere present. Um, so the, the word godliness there is simply conveying the meaning that in my life, the presence of God is always there. I realize no matter where I am, God is there. I live my life with that awareness that I can go nowhere and get out of the presence of God. If I go up to the highest mountains, God is there. If I go to the deepest depths of the earth in a cave, God is there. If I go to the depths of the sea, God is there. There is no place that I can flee from God's presence. That's what it means, that's what that Greek word godliness means there. That I live with the constant knowledge that I am in God's presence. That God is seeing and knowing and hearing everything that I do. That's godliness. He goes on and he uses, the next word he uses is faith. Now we know the scripture says that without faith it is impossible to please God because those who come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So immediately when we think of faith, we think of that aspect of us, you know, embracing who God is and accepting, you know, what God has provided for us. But the Greek word here for faith and, and the English language really has a problem sometimes translating what the actual meaning is. The, the meaning of this word is actually fidelity. That regardless of what I go through in my life, it doesn't matter. I'm still faithful to God. I still believe in Him. I still trust in Him. I, ex- I still acknowledge who He is in my life. It's a fidelity to that relationship that we have in God with Jesus Christ. The next word then is love, agape love. It's a love that loves the unlovely. It's a godly love. It's a love that I realize that God loved me when I didn't deserve it. And because of God's love for me that I didn't deserve, I am bound to love others. It's it's part of God's makeup. We cannot have God in our lives and not love someone else. If we don't love others, it's a pretty serious indication that God isn't in our lives as he wants to be. So he says to Timothy, He says that he is to love. And then he goes on and he uses another word in that is patience. And once again, the, the word patience here in the Greek doesn't mean that I simply sat down, I fold my hands, and regardless of all the troubles, I just let the troubles, you know, go over me. I I you know, I sit there and do nothing. It's exactly the opposite. It's a victorious patience. It's a, a patience uh, and a, a, a life that has victory over the sufferings. It's not something that I simply endure, but I am more than a conqueror, Paul says to the Romans. And then he uses another word he uses is the word of gentleness. And this word, there is absolutely, the Greek word here, there is absolutely no word in the English language to describe it. None. King James uses the word gentleness. That's as close as it can come to. But it, it, this Greek word is a, it's a virtue that we are to have within us. And it's a virtue where I am very humble, and yet I am very proud 
of my position in Jesus Christ. I am humble to the men and women and society around me, but I'm very proud of God's love that he has for me. It also relates to the way that I deal with others. It relates in the fact that I am willing to forgive others of their sins. But because I am forgiving others of their sins and their wrongdoings toward me, I will never allow myself to wrong someone else and feel that it's acceptable. Or I will never allow myself to participate in a sin that someone else is participating in that I'm willing to forgive them. That's the, that's the core essence of that word that is translated gentleness. So this morning, as an encouragement to you, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That's all that matters. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. If we do that, we will be all of these virtues that Paul spoke about. We will be a shining light and a witness. And that's what Paul says. He says, you have, you have been a witness to many. Do you want to be a witness? Live that kind of a life. Shall we pray? God, we give you thanks this morning for your word. Your word is truth. Father, this morning we thank you for the challenge that we find in your word that we can apply to our everyday lives. Father, this morning help us to constantly remember that when we accept you, your provision of salvation in Jesus Christ, that we become men and women of God. And that if we are men and women of God, there is a, a way in which we are to conduct our lives for your honor, for your glory, and for the building of your kingdom. So, Father, I thank you for each one here. We pray your blessing upon this service in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll ask our chorister to come lead us in our time of singing. Oh, oh, oh. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When God's own Son was crucified, for man the creature's sin. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me, because he loves me so. 
Thus might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt mine eyes to tears. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, this I know. He gave himself to die for me because he loves me so. Back a few pages. Number 12. Number 12, and I think we should stand for this song if we can. Number 12, holy, holy, holy. Ooh. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee which wert an art and evermore shall be holy 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 though the darkness
Good morning. It is good to be here this morning. Good to be with you. And I'm going to invite you to stand for just a moment, if you would. Go ahead and stand. Uh, I have one other thing I'd like to pray for this morning. There's power in prayer. I truly believe that. Uh, Titus shared with us in the pastor's study this morning before we prayed, he's having trouble with his eye. Again, his left eye. Uh, He had a tear in it back last fall. Uh, They did surgery on it. It was much better, but he's starting to have some, some issues with it again. So I think it would be good just to pray for Titus this morning. He has an appointment on Tuesday uh, of this week, so he needs to go back and, and see what's going on with it again. So let's, let's pray for Titus, shall we? Father, this morning we know that you're a God who hears, a God who knows, a God who is uh, not just our creator, but our sustainer and our healer. And God, we pray your special touch upon Titus' eye, Lord. We don't know exactly what's going on. The doctors don't seem to know exactly what the issue is. God, we would just pray that you would touch that eye if it's not against your will and heal it. And that uh, when he goes back on Tuesday, there would not be any more problems, any more issues. Or Lord, that you would use the doctors, that you would use whatever is necessary means uh, by man to, to bring healing to that eye that it no longer bothers him, he no longer struggles with, uh, the, with uh, the double vision or with having uh, blurriness or anything of that nature that he experienced before. So God, just touch him, give him a sense of peace, give him a sense of comfort, to know that you hold him in his hand, uh, in your hand, and that you will walk with him uh, through this. So just bless him in a special way and help us to remember him, especially on Tuesday as he has this appointment. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to begin this morning, we are doing a little bit of a review. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I preached a message. We looked at uh, Jesus, <clears throat> and I mentioned about uh, something that was brought up in one of our devotional times at one of our Rosedale meetings. Got me thinking about some stuff, and, and just the idea that Jesus stopped. Remember we talked about that? Jesus stopped. And the different times, the different places throughout Scripture, that, that as Jesus was walking along with his disciples and teaching, that he stopped because he had something special to share with them. Or he was walking along, and we looked at blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus hollered out, you know, Son of God, have mercy on me. And and Jesus, in the midst of what he was doing, the important things that he was doing, he was headed to Jerusalem for the Passover, headed to the cross. He stopped. And he dealt with blind Bartimaeus. And the realization, that the question I asked was, other than Jesus Christ, who's the most important person in the world to you? And we came to the conclusion, or at least I did, that the most important person in the world to you, other than Jesus, is the person right in front of you. We looked at the story of the Good Samaritan, and the, and the challenge for each one of us to recognize that we come into circumstances and times and places in our lives that God wants us to stop. Because there's something there that he wants us to do, someone that he wants to touch, and he'll use us in that circumstance, in that time to do that. Now that got me thinking along some things, you know, as as we look at Jesus and as we look at his life, Jesus is the greatest teacher that ever lived, but he was far more than that, for sure. But that stopping was not all that Jesus did. There were other things that, that Jesus did that we can learn a lot from as well, and I'd like to look at one of those this morning. And when I mention this, you're going to say, well, yeah, I know that. Jesus prayed. That doesn't sound very profound, does it? Jesus prayed. <laughs> we all know that. Jesus prayed. But I want you to think about that for just a minute. Think about who Jesus is, who Jesus was, the Son of God. God in the flesh, God incarnate, completely God, also completely man. And he prayed. Well, what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God, right? When we pray, we talk to God. So if Jesus prayed, God incarnate is talking to God the Father. God incarnate and God the Father are one. They're in perfect agreement. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, the Trinity. Why do we pray? Well, I often pray because I want to know what God's will is, right? I want to know what God wants me to do. Did Jesus have to know 
what God wanted him to do? Or being he was God, did he know what God wanted him to do? I mean, we, this, yeah, my mind was going a little wacky with us trying to think about these things this morning, but there's some things that we can learn when we look at that simple concept that, that Jesus prayed. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, we're going to look at a few different places where Jesus prayed and try to wrap our minds around some of this. Jesus prayed. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and verse 13. And I, uh, I brought my NIV Bible this morning. I usually use my King James. I uh, brought my NIV. Some of these things are a little easier to read in there. And it very clearly says in almost all of them that Jesus prayed. Jesus uses that terminology, Jesus prayed. So Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spend the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. And we'll stop there. So here's Jesus. He goes off to a mountainside to pray. The Bible says he spent the whole night praying to God. And then what happens after that? The next morning he comes down. And out of all of his disciples, all of his followers, he chooses the 12 that are going to be his apostles. Now, in my mind and in our minds, that's a good time to pray, right? That makes sense. Jesus is trying to put together his disciples, put together the group of men that are going to walk with him. He's going to teach them. He's going to give them the, the message, the keys of the kingdom, and they're going to carry that message for all the world. Jesus spent time talking to God about that. Now, likely, we do the same thing, right? You have a major decision in your life. Something big is coming up. You have to make a choice, make a decision. We pray, right? We pray. Jesus prayed when it came to choosing the apostles, the disciples. Turn to Matthew 14. Matthew 14. We're going to look at another one. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Very familiar account. Very familiar story in the scriptures. Matthew 14, beginning with verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed they're sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. So Jesus, large crowd following him, large crowd gathered together, 5,000 plus women and children, and there's nothing to eat, no food. Five loaves, two fish. Jesus, looking up to heaven, to God, blesses the loaves and the fish, gives thanks for it, and then they start to distribute it, and there's enough for everyone. What exactly do you think Jesus prayed? Be interesting to know, wouldn't it? <laughs> Did he pray that it would be multiplied? Did he have to pray that it would be multiplied? Did he simply pray, God, you be glorified as this happens here? But Jesus prayed. Now we'll go on because right after this, Jesus Praise again, verse 22 and 23. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat, 
go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. So he prayed before he fed the 5,000. After he fed the 5,000, he sent the people away. After they were all gone, he told the disciples to get into a boat, go on ahead of him. He went up to a mountainside again, spend time alone, and pray. Now what do you suppose he prayed? What, what thoughts come to your mind? Did he thank God for what had happened? Did he pray for the people that were there? For the message that they had heard, the things that he had shared with them? Did he pray for his disciples who were now headed out in the middle of the lake who were going to have some trouble very soon? What did Jesus pray? One more yet. Matthew chapter 26. Very familiar one. Matthew chapter 26. When we think about Jesus praying, this is often probably the one that will first come to your mind. Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 to 46. In the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus prays. He prays the first time, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Now we know that, that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God's Son, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. Yet in this passage, it is very clear that Jesus has a choice. Jesus has given a choice because he has humanity. He's taken humanity upon him he can choose not to go to the cross. He could have chosen not to die for us. He's saying to God, if there is another way, if there is some way that I don't have to do this, but if there isn't, most of all, I want your will to be done. The second time he prays, my Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. It's almost like it's more of a resolve. That is going to happen. And then in the third one, the same resolve as will. Praise the same thing again. Father, your will be done. I know what my flesh wants. I know what I want to do. I know what I don't want to do. But God, your will be done. Why did Jesus pray? There's a, several different prayers that are recorded in the scriptures. We have prayers of Moses. We have prayers of some other people as well. And I can recall certain prayers that, that people have prayed over me throughout the years. 
Very special, very meaningful. I can remember the day that we got married. One of the things that we did in our marriage ceremony was have all the pastors that were there gather around us and pray for us. I think I'll always remember that. I can remember the day that I was ordained, knelt in front of you as a congregation, and the pastors that were there giving leadership to that service laid their hands on us, me, and prayed. That does something. That does something. Jesus prayed. And I want to look at one more passage yeah, this morning. Turn to John 17. John chapter 17. Everything that I've shared up to this point, in essence, is introduction, so to speak. This is really the heart of what I want to look at this morning. Because we have recorded in John chapter 17, Jesus' prayer. This actually is the Lord's prayer. We talk about the Lord's prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. That's what he teaches us to pray, how to pray. That We call that the Lord's prayer, and it is. But John 17 is actually what the Lord prayed. <laughs> what the Lord prayed, so it's the Lord's prayer. And I've broken this down into three different sections it breaks up very easily into that. And the first section, what we're going to look at, is that Jesus actually prayed for himself. Jesus prayed for himself. John chapter 17, verses 1 to 5. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus' prayer to the Father for himself is glorify me. That's what he's asking. He's asking the Father, glorify me. Why is he asking that? So that God would be glorified. Jesus is saying, as you lift me up, Father, lift me up. I am headed to the cross. I am going there to die. I'm going there to do your will. Glorify me. Because if that happens, you will be glorified. You'll receive the honor. You'll receive the glory. I want people to see you. I want people to know and to understand that I came from you, that you sent me, that the message I have is from you. Glorify me. Jesus prays for himself. In the next section, Jesus prays for his apostles, his disciples, those that are with him. Let's go on, verse 6. I have revealed to you those whom you gave me out of the world, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is, not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. 
They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus, praying for his disciples, he prays two things in essence, two major things. One, protect them. Protect them. Father, protect these men. Protect them. Protect them from what? Well, for the last three years, these men had followed Jesus. They were his disciples. They had walked with him, talked with him, lived with him. That was coming to an end. Very clearly, very abruptly, it was going to stop. Jesus said, I'm praying for them. Protect them when this happens. Secondly, Jesus understood the the circumstances surrounding how all that was going to play out. He understood the the arrest. He understood the trial. He understood the the mocking and the scourging and the crucifixion and the resurrection. He understood that because he was treated as a criminal, he was looked at as a criminal, so too would they by association. They were connected with him. Jesus prays to God, protect them. Jesus also prays for them, recognizing that he would no longer physically be with them. He couldn't be their protector. Looking forward to the day when the Holy Spirit would come and walk with them and be their guide. Father, protect them. And I also think in Jesus' mind was the idea that, you know, keep these men, protect these men from apostasy, from from falling away, from, from worldliness, from unholiness. Protect them. Protect them. And also protect them from the evil one. Keep them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world. I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. But protect them. Protect them. And then secondly, sanctify them. Sanctify means to set them apart. Set them apart. Help them to realize that they are chosen. They are set apart. They have a special purpose, a special plan. Sanctify them. Sanctify means to set apart. Charles Spurgeon once said, the more truth you believe, the more sanctified you will be. The operation of truth upon the mind is to separate a man from the world onto the service of God. Jesus said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. If we're going to be sanctified, if we're going to be set apart, the more truth we believe, the more sanctified we will be. The more time we spend in the Word of God, the more we understand it, the more we realize it, the more we hang on to it and follow it, the more sanctified we will be. Jesus prayed that for his disciples. Sanctify them. So he prayed for himself, glorify me. He prayed for his disciples, protect them, sanctify them. But then in the last six verses... Jesus prayed for you and me. Jesus prayed for you and me. Now think about that. The Creator God, the one who created us, created this world, created everything that is in it. King of kings, Lord of lords, prayed for you, prayed for me. And like I said, I can, I can remember very vividly those special points in my life when people gathered around and, and prayed or laid their hands on me and prayed. But I want you to get the essence this morning of the idea of Jesus putting his hand on your shoulder and praying for you. Because that's what he did. That's what he did. In these last several verses, Jesus prayed for you and I. And let's look at what he prayed. Verse 20. 
My prayer is not for them alone, speaking of his disciples. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus prayed for you and I. First thing that he prayed is that all may be one. Father, I pray that all Maybe one. You see, Jesus was looking forward to the day when people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, every race, every class, every social level would be gathered together around the throne in heaven. But even here on earth, that all of us would be one. We would recognize our oneness in Jesus Christ. We would recognize our oneness at the foot of the cross. It's level. The ground is level there. Doesn't matter what race, what language, what class, what social level. Doesn't matter what sins we've been involved in. When it comes to the cross, we're all one. We're all one. Jesus prayed that we would understand that. That we would grasp that. That we're one. One at the foot of the cross. He says, Father, that all of them may be one. Now that doesn't mean that all of us being one, that we're all going to agree in everything. He's not praying that, God, that they all do church the same way. Or God, that they, that they all follow certain things all exactly the same way. He's not praying for uniformity. He's praying for unity that they all would be one. They all would understand that basic, simple truth that in me is life eternal. And that brings you all together. You're one. in me, one at the cross. Secondly, he prays not only that we would be one, but that we would be in him, or Father, that they would be in us. That they would be in us. One with God. One with God, connected to and committed to God, so that, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, there's been different times throughout history that people have come together as one. In their own minds, uh, by their own design, by their own uh, sort of plan, they have come together and they've done amazingly good things and they've done amazingly bad things. We as human beings have done. (laughs) People throughout history have built some amazing structures because they've come together and done that. People have done an awful lot of devastation in this world, groups of people, because they've come together and decided to do that. God wants us to come together. Jesus prays that we would come together, not just in our own accord, but that we would be together as one, that we all would be one, but we would be in God as we're in one together. Not just together like this, but together this way as well. (laughs) So that our togetherness is not a a recognition of who we are and what we've done, but it's it's a recognition that God is in us, that God is working in us, that we are in him. 
And if you think about that, how else can people from every tongue, tribe, nation, class, and social level ever come together and do anything constructive without being in God? That's the only way it's ever going to happen. So Jesus prays that we would be in him, committed, connected, so that the world would know why Jesus came, that he came from God. They would see the message correctly. Thirdly, he prays that all would be one. He prays that we would be in him or be in us. And third, that there would be complete unity. Complete unity. Man to man and man to God. But again, not out of coercion. Not out of force. Again, not uniformity. Not a, a unity out of compromise. Well, let's just get down to the lowest common denominator and we can all get along because we all believe this. No. No. It's a unity of love, a unity of identity in Jesus Christ. Common recognition that without Jesus Christ, we're nothing. <laughs> we're nothing. It's sort of combining the first one and the second one together, that all of us would be one, and that as we are in him, we will come to complete unity. We'll recognize that. And then the last thing that Jesus prays, he prays that, Father, that they would be with me and see my glory. Be with me. And see my glory. That's his desire. He says, I want. I want. Jesus is longing for the consummation of all things. Longing for the day when his people are gathered together with him in heaven. Longing for the day when the children come home. <laughs> when they're home. Looking forward to that. He is waiting. He is longing expectantly for his children to come home. Romans chapter 8, I won't take time to read it, but it talks about how the earth groans. The earth is waiting for that day to come. Sin has corrupted this earth. Sin has corrupted creation. Sin has created all kinds of havoc in our world. The world itself, the earth itself, Romans says, is groaning for the day when things go back to normal. Things go back to the way they're supposed to be from creation. When God is in full control of everything, and it's very evident in everything that is happening. When the earth is turned over completely to him. And Jesus is sitting on the throne. We as believers are groaning for that day as well. But the recognition that Jesus also groans for that day. He longs for that day. He wants that day to come. Wants that day to come. And I don't know. I, you know I sometimes get pictures in my head. I don't know if they're correct or not. I don't share them all with you, which is probably a good thing. Um, but I have this picture in my head sometimes of Jesus <laughs> just waiting. Waiting to come. And I don't know what you envision when, when you envision Jesus waiting to come. There's times when I'm at home and I'm waiting and I'm in my recliner, I'm kicked back, I got my feet up, I'm half awake, I'm half sleeping, I'm sort of there and I'm sort of not there, but I'm waiting, <laughs> I'm waiting. Do you think that's what Jesus is doing? There's other times that I'm waiting for something to happen or somebody's going to come or something. I'm, I'm just, I can't stand still. I'm pacing. Ask my wife. I'm in here. I'm over there. I'm looking out the window. Something, what's going on? Yeah. That's the picture. That's the picture I have of Jesus. Waiting, longing to Come. Because he wants us to be with him. He prayed for that. He's looking forward to that day. He said it's his desire. I want them to be with me. Not only to be with me, but I want them to see my glory. The glory that you have given me. See, Jesus doesn't just want us to spend eternity with him in heaven. He wants us to see him for who he really is, to see God for who he really is. He wants us to be together. He wants you and I to experience and to see the glory of God. 
and it's fullness, completeness. Can you imagine that? Jesus prayed. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples. And he prayed for you and I. And I want you to notice something, and I may have missed some things in here. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I picked out what I thought were the major themes, the major things that Jesus prayed in this passage in John 17. Jesus prayed one thing for himself, right? Glorify me. Jesus prayed two things for his disciples. He doubled it. Protect them, sanctify them. And then when it came to you and I, he doubled it again. Prayed four things. That we all would be one. That we would be in him. That we would have complete unity amongst ourselves and with him. And that one day we would be with him and see his glory. Jesus prayed for you and I. Let's pray. Father, this morning it's just so humbling, so uh, amazing. Lord, to think that, that you prayed for us. So many, many years ago, yet as you were there, and as you prayed, you prayed for each and every one of us here today. You pray for all those that would believe and the message that you had given to the disciples, the message of the gospel, the message of salvation through you. You prayed, Father, that we all would be one, that we would recognize that at the foot of the cross the ground is level. You pray that we would completely be in you. That we would be completely connected, completely committed to you. You prayed, Father, for complete unity in our relationships with each other and with you. Putting those first two together, there would be complete unity. And the only way that can happen is when we're right with you and right with our fellow man. You prayed for that. That's your desire. That's what you want. And then, Jesus, you also prayed, not only for the time that we're on the earth, the time that we work through all of these things, but, Lord, you look forward to the time and you pray for the time when we would come home. Be joint heirs with you, be children gathered around the throne of the Heavenly Father. You're looking forward to the day when we can be with you and that we can see your glory, we can, we can see you for who you truly are. God, you... You prayed for us. Lord, you prayed that we would see that. We would see you. We would be with you. Father, this morning it's our prayer that it would be our desire to be one. That it would be our desire to recognize who we truly are in your sight, that we are sinners in need of salvation. And that the only way we can be one with each other is at the foot of the cross, laying down our pride, our selfishness, anything else that we hang on to that we think is of value means nothing at the foot of the cross. We're all sinners. We're all lost. Father, we pray as well that we would be faithful to you, we would be committed to you, we would follow you, we would walk with you, we would be in you as you have prayed for us. And we pray as well, Father, for complete unity Unity in our own hearts, a a unity with you, a unity that follows you, a unity that is totally committed to you, and a unity amongst the brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. God, a oneness that can only exist in you and through you. And God, we pray as well for faith, for endurance, and for discernment, Lord, as we walk through this life. And we, Father, we, we thank you for the hope that you've given us through Jesus Christ, that one day, one day we will be with him in glory. 
that we will see him face to face and we will be with him for all eternity. Jesus, I thank you this morning that today as well you stopped, in a sense, and you laid your hand on each and every person here and you prayed for us. We felt that this morning. And I thank you for that. God, help us to be faithful to you. Jesus, help us to be faithful to you. And continue to walk with you, recognizing that you love us, you care about us, and you're waiting expectantly to see us face to face. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen.